Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you uh, How you doing? I'm doing okay. We're having a few environmental problems here. Well, you know, there's a, kind of a strange muffled quality to your voice, well, and as a result, I have no idea what you just said, Mickey. I think that'll be evident when this, the source will be evident uh, when you review the video. But you remember I had that mold in my file cabinet? <laughs> Mickey, you'll... Mickey, you might as well be speaking Serbian, okay? I mean, I can't hear you. <laughs> well, you. You'll notice that the file cabinet isn't there anymore. The file cabinet, I heard that. Yeah, okay, well, so um, anyway, we're taking a few environmental precautions around here. We'll, we'll have the problem cleaned up in, in, by next time. Environmental precautions. i got to bring in the SWAT team. SWAT team. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, I got those key phrases, and I'm putting it together in my mind here, and it's starting to make uh, a lot of sense. Thanks, Mickey. Okay, well, this should be better. Ah, that was like a breath of spring air. Okay, good. Which we could use, because uh, our, our uh, air conditioning broke down yesterday, so we may be doing a little sweating today. So, uh, how you been? I was on vacation last week. I know, you're probably even more relaxed than usual. You know, it's funny... <laughs> it doesn't work that way with me. I mean, this whole, like, uh, rejuvenation, regeneration uh, model of vacationing, does that ever work for you? Yeah. Because with me, it's like, before you go on vacation, you are almost hopelessly snowed under in unfinished tasks and unsent emails, and then after the vacation, you are hopelessly, hopelessly snowed under, and that's the way I feel now. I'm full of despair. Uh, well, you're always full of despair. Hang on, I just have to remove this garment I'm wearing. Wow, you know what it does to me when you say things like that. I know, you... I know, I know, I know, I know. I shouldn't be provocative. Um, um, the, um, so anyway, well, for, yeah. for me, you know, since I'm an allergic person, when you travel you always feel better because you're allergic to wherever you are. So I'm aller well, I think what the problem is I'm allergic to the trees in my neighborhood. Uh huh. So when I travel, they're new trees, so I feel better. Is it true that it takes allergies a while to warm up? It takes two or three days. So if you, keep, if you move every two or three days, you're in good shape. I should just become a rambling man, Mickey. Oh, it, that may happen. I've, I've been lusting after you know, mobile homes and things like that. Oh, I thought you were going to say women all over the country, but, um, which is another reason to be a rambling man. No, but Reagan was right about trees. They're the source of evil. I didn't realize he put it quite like that. They were part of the evil empire? No, they were, he said they were the cause of smog, and he got a lot of grief for it. Hmm. Pollution. He said they were a cause of pollution. Okay. So, well, anyway, so America had to go last week without uh, either Bob or Mickey. That must have been hard. Yeah, I'm sure, they're, I'm sure they're in deep withdrawal. I mean, the country survived, you know, but it must have been tough. Um, um, and, but i got to say, you were game. You were willing to go uh, mano a mano with your brother Steve um, in my absence. I was, although that was really half-hearted of me. Right. It doesn't sound like you absolutely was, harassed him about it. But in any event, he did not. Uh, he was not game. Well, right? he was so, busy. He's a lawyer. He has a family to feed. So, in other words, uh, he lacks. Uh, it's his manhood. You're calling into question. He was unwilling to face you. No, that's not what I said. Uh, okay. On, well, to, I'll, e I'll email that summary to him, Mickey. I have to make one more adjustment. Hang on. I thought you were uh, going after my mother. You know. <laughs> I'm not even gonna. I'm not gonna go near that, Mickey. Okay. Uh, but whenever she wants to come on blogging heads, you know, sure, absolutely. Well, first, we have to get her like on using a computer. Um. So, anyway, well, I'm glad you're 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 hopeless and depressed. I am. Should be easy pickings. Um. Fortunately, we're going to start off by talking about Iraq, and that'll well, cheer I me up. Well, I actually heard some optimistic news about Iraq. Mickey, you always have some optimistic news well, about Iraq. I talk with uh, one of my usual sources, uh, an, an Iraq veteran. Uh, What's his name? Scott? Uh, no, Scott Thomas, yeah. Not right. Scott Thomas? Not Scott Thomas. Okay. Um, uh, and he said there was good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is, you know, this idea on, the, on, on right-wing websites that the surge is working and that Petraeus is going to win the war for us and, you know, we just give it, a, give it a few months and American public... Opinion will change, and you know you can always see, already see the polls ticking up, uh, which you can uh, support for the Iraq War, is is a little bogus or a lot bogus because, uh, for one thing, uh, you know we're securing the areas where our troops are, but we have about a third of the troops we need, so we're <laughs> securing not, you know there are a whole lot of areas we aren't securing, mm -hmm. and we're not going to have those troops, uh, and and second this idea that the Anbar 
uh, model can can be applied to mixed areas is crazy. And the Anbar model, where we go to the sheiks and say, you know, look, why don't you ally with us against right. Al Qaeda? Uh, they're happy to do that when there are no when there's Sunni sheikhs and there, there's no there are no Shiites around to fight. Right. Uh, and that worked, but it doesn't work in mixed areas like the Allah province. The reason we, uh, um, uh, the example cited was Bakuba, which is in the Allah province, and uh, you know, one, I think one of our generals walked through the marketplace there and showed that he was safe, and it was a big deal. But apparently, Bakuba is, is more or less a ghost town; people have fled. So the idea that that this is an example of of the surge working in mixed areas is is questionable. The the, the, that's the bad news. The, the, the good news is the, the, this guy hears rumors that uh, underneath the guise of attempting to restore a unitary government throughout Iraq uh, by precision application of an insufficient number of American troops, we are actually giving the tacit green light to the sort of slow-motion ethnic cleansing that will set us up for a more stable situation when we withdraw. Uh, so uh, so that, <clears throat> that's the good news, accelerated ethnic cleansing? Well, Bob, the, the I'm good, kind the of good, kidding. The good I'm kind of kidding because, yes, no, we... we the, the good news is that, 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 that our, our generals aren't so stupid as they, they're not looking to see what situation they're going to leave when we withdraw and to realize that the, the hope of a, of a mixed unitary government extending throughout Iraq as opposed to, uh, you know, ethnically relatively homogeneous enclaves in some sort of stable balance of power with each other, uh, is, it, the, 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 that dream is, is futile, and they're abandoning it and, and, and re reverting to the realist sort of Yugoslavia school, which is uh, the best we can hope for is a, a balance of power among warring ethnic communities where they, they don't kill each other. Well, right, so that they're not warring in the long run. I mean, well, that, that the stable solution is some, some sort of partition-like thing. And, well, and no, I, I've been, yeah, I've been, I, I said at the beginning of the surge, I think, that, that the problem with it was that it was premised on something other than that as the most plausible yeah. well, form well, of near-term stability. Right. And I'm, so I say maybe it's not. Maybe underneath it all it's premised on something else. Right. Okay. Uh, although, uh, yeah, although they're, they're, they're concealing it well in all their public utterances, if that's the case. Yes, they are. But, um... Except that this leak to the New York Times yesterday about how we have a plan and all we care about is security throughout the country is sort of an abandonment of idealistic, lofty goals in, in favor of gritty, realistic goals. But yes, it doesn't say that that um, you know that we're accepting a sort of de facto partition. The, yeah. Um, but, but but here's the thing. I mean, I, I, it's, it's not that they aren't warring. In other words, during the Cold War, we were technically warring, but there was a balance of power. So yeah. everybody says, well, we can't arm these people because uh, it'll just it's it's like a, a tinderbox. It's 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 it means that when we leave, they'll have more arms to fight each other. Well, that's not true. If if by you know by arming these Sunni tribes, we achieve a, some sort of Balance where each side feels they should. They're not going to attack each other because the other side has arms. So the, if you get it just right, yeah, and, and it really does lead to a cessation of hostilities. Yeah, and there's no indication we'll get it just right. But uh, the, if if that's what we're trying to do, I mean, apparently the central government did not like that we armed the Sunnis, uh, and we said, "Sorry, buddy, we're we're doing it." Uh, right. Uh, so um, that indicates that um, I don't know. That that, that that's my optimism. How but, you know, that? you're right that the polls have gone up. Uh, I was shocked to hear that now, uh, according to the New York Times poll, 42% of Americans think invading Iraq was a good idea, whereas some, I don't know, months ago it was 35%. Uh, that just to me is astounding. I, I, A, that it could be that high in absolute terms, and B, that it could have actually risen appreciably. In I mean, what do you attribute that to? Because... Because the line on all the right-wing blogs is that the story of the success is not getting out. Well, may, they must be wrong. <laughs> I mean, it couldn't be that the spin is as negative as they're portraying it if the poll numbers are really growing almost rapidly, right? It could be a bunch of things. First, I want to see another poll. This could be a, a weird poll. Second, it could be just a general reflection of the terror, aborted terror attacks in Britain and the heightened awareness of, of, of terror causes sort of a rallying 
around Bush, even on an extraneous issue like Iraq. The celebration of policies that have made the problem worse? Well, in that, the, the point is that they don't see that connection, Bob. Or Apparently the, not. The alternative is that they see all connections, and they're taking a really long view, and they think that 30 years down the road, maybe the Iraq invasion will look like a good idea. I don't think that's what's happening. I think it's probably a combination of terror, good news, and... And, and a, slightly inaccurate and polling. And slightly inaccurate polling, although... Pro yeah. It's probably a very modest upward bump, but still... Now, now uh, you know, Bush yesterday uh, trotted out this, this rhetorical device that uh, I think he kind of counts on to, to, to maintain public support, which is to identify al-Qaeda in Iraq very closely with al-Qaeda per se, you know, the, the guys who actually attacked us. Um, and in the course of that, he created this straw man. He says, those who justify withdrawing our troops from Iraq by denying the threat of al-Qaeda in Iraq and its ties to Osama bin Laden ignore the clear consequences of such retreat. I'm not aware of anyone who falls into that category. Are you? Any, anyone who, who, who would justify withdrawing the troops by denying the threat of al-Qaeda in Iraq and its, and its ties to Osama bin Laden? Do, I mean, people don't deny that there are now ties between the two, right? No, no. But this is, a, this is a classic bogus Bush meme uh, that, you know, has he convinced anything, anybody of anything in his second term? I mean, he, he campaigned for Social Security. As a result, his plan became more unpopular than ever. He campaigned for immigration reform. As a result, his plan became more unpopular than ever. And now he's campaigning for the surge. Why? I, that's what's so bizarre about this poll. It can't be that this Bush propaganda blitz, you know, one of one of... Uh, you know, several repeated propaganda blitzes, uh, is working. It must be something else. Uh, well, I guess. I don't know what it is. I mean, maybe it's that, I mean, yesterday I didn't think he did a, a great job from a strict, strictly PR point of view, because in, in the course of fleshing out the relationship between the two, he felt compelled to be honest enough that, that some of what he said, the relationship between the two al-Qaeda's, some of what he said amounted to kind of an indictment of his policies. He says... The merger, that is, between the previously separate right. Zarqawi group right. and bin Laden's al-Qaeda, the merger also gave al-Qaeda senior leadership a foothold in Iraq to extend its geographic presence. Well, obviously, it wouldn't have made that extension successfully had we not invaded Iraq. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole point. And, and uh, you know, and, and his, his idea, I mean, to the extent that there's logic to what he's saying, the logic, I guess, goes goes something like this: that uh, um, you know, if the two, regardless of the histories of the two Al Qaeda's, if they are now in some meaningful sense one, and we know that Al Qaeda at its base wants to continue attacking America, then the mortal enemy of America is manifest in Al Qaeda in, in Iraq, and we have to stay there and fight them. That, that's superficially not a crazy thing, but, but among the subtleties it kind of ignores is uh, the possibility that actually uh, the, the main rallying cry that al-Qaeda in Iraq has in its favor is the presence of American troops. I would well, think that's, that may be the case. You know, there's a lot of, there is this growing resentment we've talked about of al-Qaeda in Iraq in, in these Sunni areas and well, so you, on. The question is, do you think al-Qaeda in Iraq would be uh, wiped out faster if we stay or if we leave, uh, I well, I find it sort of hard. I, 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 I find, you know, I think, I think probably the population will turn against it, and I don't think the threat of Al Qaeda in Iraq is is a reason to stay. But uh, you know, we are killing a lot of them, so you would think that that Bush's policy makes sense in that, you know, we should keep the surge going uh, in pursuit of Al Qaeda, and 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 sort of that's that would be all he was saying, and, and then the surge will end, and we will have kill as many al-Qaeda people as we can before we leave. Uh, the al-Qaeda well, the al th th there, there are... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, there are other questions as well. Uh, y you know, you ask one, but uh, there's the question of, you know, are we killing them in ways that create more of them or less? And one thing I'm suggesting is that the presence of American troops in Iraq doing, you know, which is a prerequisite for us being the ones who kill them... Uh, Maybe the strongest recruiting angle they've got going right now. Well, certainly it is globally, but I'm talking, we're talking about in Iraq. There's a bifurcation. Well, no, I, I suspect in Iraq, uh, continuing to recruit Iraqis to Al Qaeda in Iraq. Of course, it was not originally an Iraqi organization, but more and more the foot soldiers are Iraqi. Um, I would think that, that the presence of American troops is, is a godsend there 
Then, which isn't to say that in some ways it's, it, you know, it, it does create real problems for them. I mean, there's also the question of, if we leave, will al-Qaeda in Iraq really be a threat to America? I mean, no, no, I'm, I'm, conce- I'm conceding that that's not a reason to stay. I, I don't think the threat of you know, regional, it, it blowing up into a regional uh, conflagration is a reason to stay. The only reason to stay is, is the Darfur genocide argument that John Burns made quite eloquently on Charlie Rose, which is if we leave, the level of violence will ex- escalate exponentially. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis will die. And that's a pretty good reason not to uh, abandon them, given that especially that we made the mess in the first place. That's the only reason to stay, as far as I can see. Oh, well, I can see staying for other reasons. I can see staying to preserve American interests. But, but, and, and, and that's the argument Bush is making here. No, but you don't buy any of his arguments about how it serves American interests. And I don't well, either, so. I, I, I think, you know, his argument has enough superficial plausibility that you at least do have to go through the process of critiquing it, you know, which I've, I've tried to do. Well, right. But, but, but I think, about, uh, I know you know. the real reasons that you, Bob Wright, would buy, not the phony reasons that Bush is putting forward. Well, no, but I mean, I, I wouldn't dismiss out of hand the idea. I mean, I mean, you know, the generic idea that we don't want to, uh, for example, we don't want to leave a, a, a big base for anti-American terrorists in Iraq. That's a, that's a significant consideration that's related to what he's saying. Um, I, I do, I, I mean, I, but I do think we should not casually accept the idea that just because U.S. troops are now public enemy number one of al-Qaeda in Iraq, they would continue to be, you know, America would continue to be its big enemy if we left. I mean, from the beginning, the marriage between al-Qaeda, bin Laden's al-Qaeda, and and what's now called al-Qaeda in Iraq was uh, an awkward one. The whole strategy of al-Qaeda in Iraq of fomenting sectarian war between Shiites and Sunni was not on bin Laden's agenda at all. This he, is, even though he was no great friend of the Shiites, it wasn't his game plan. This is, this is a phony argument we're having, Bob. I'm not talking about casually accepting anything. I'm saying not casually, after you've thought of it, do you really think that stopping, preventing an al-Qaeda base in Iraq, given that they will be unpo- very unpopular after we leave, is a reason for staying? And I'm saying no, and you're ginning up some sort of phony argument by saying, well, we shouldn't dismiss it casually. I'm not dismissing it casually. I'm dismissing it after sober reflection. Oh, Okay. Uh, I mean, I, then it's okay to dismiss it. <laughs> oh. I don't know, but but I mean, I, but I do think. I mean, the one the one thing I'm still not sure I have enough reason to dismiss is, you know, is the threat of a big base for terrorists in Iraq. I mean, I think we tend to overestimate the importance of things like that just because we underestimate the ease with which terrorists can actually organize without occupying large swaths of turf. But still. It's true that they're better off having large swaths of turf than not having them. You there see, were aspects of the, of, the, of the training and recruitment right. they did in Afghanistan that would have been a lot right, the harder if they didn't have Afghanistan will, and so on. So I, I don't – I mean, you're not casually dismissing no, that part of the is, argument. Will, I mean, you're not, you're not thoughtfully dismissing that part of the argument, are you? Well, the question is, will Iraq bec- become Waziristan too? And, and the evidence that I've seen is no, the, the, the Sunnis in Iraq are not, very, not as hospitable to – Al-Qaeda setting up terrorist training camps in Iraq, as, as the Waziristanis, or however you call them, are. Uh, so, so that that is, you know, given all the negative consequences that flow from our continued presence in Iraq and our ability to, to sort of contain Al-Qaeda and blow up their bases from afar, if, if we, even if we withdraw, uh, that's not a reason enough to justify, you know, keeping even 50,000 troops there. So in your mind, the only remaining reason to keep American troops there is the moral one, it's which John, may have pragmatic consequences, it's, but, but, but it's the goal of preventing genocide. You don't see it's any... It's John Burns reason, though. Yeah, I mean, would you? Are you for staying there? Well, no, not in any heartfelt way, and I'm certainly leaning increasingly toward, you know, a uh, uh, withdrawal that may be gradual but still should be a withdrawal, but I'm not totally... Uh, I, the situation isn't just crystal clear to me that, that, that uh, I, I'm not convinced that American interests would be served by withdrawal. I tend to think that, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to me as clear as it sounds like it seems to you. It just, I, you know, maybe you know more and you've, you've reached a, a state of muddled confusion uh, through greater knowledge that, than I have. My impression is that the, the Sunni tribes in Anbar have turned against al-Qaeda, and they didn't like al-Qaeda, and they're not about to welcome them back. Uh, and and that it, 
So, yeah. so what's the, what, where is the, uh, where is the argument against that, given, given all the, the arguments that you know about the negative effects of us staying? No, you may be right, and I mean, come to think of it, it may be the fate of the Sunni territories to become something like a proxy state of, you know, Saudi Arabia or some big, big sponsor that would not, uh, would not be at all enthusiastic about uh, hosting Al Qaeda in its traditional form. It's, you know, maybe you're right. No, they, I mean, uh, I think you probably are, uh, as 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 as, but, but what's, as you usually are, and as I usually think you are. But what's your argument? Uh, this would be the first time I've ever convinced you of anything. What's your argument uh, against the John Burns complaint, which seemed quite powerful? Well, it, yeah, no, I agree. We should try to avoid the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. Okay. Uh, but that, to my mind, it, it, and to Burns' mind, that means continuing the surge until it collapses of, of, collapses of its own weight in in March, when the troop, you know, the troop rotation cycle means we basically have to end it anyway. Well, that's not what I'm convinced of. I'm not. I'm not convinced that that anybody has a really clear idea of exactly how you prevent this genocide, and I'm not convinced that an orderly withdrawal would lead to the genocide. I, I, I'm willing to accept the, the consensus of many experts that if we withdrew all our troops within the next three months, yes. But, but that's not what I'm proposing anyway. But I think Burns was, I, I don't think Burns was just arguing against a precipitous withdrawal. I think, that, you know, the... Well, then that's the we part of his argument I, I'm not convinced of, that, that any form of withdrawal, I mean, what's he saying? We have to stay there forever to prevent, you know... Well, that, 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 that's the dilemma, but it might be that he's, we have to stay there for a decade. Yes, that's not the, you know... The no, and I, I, I'm, I'm so, I, yeah, no, I, it's hard, it would be hard to convince me that it's worth that. But, um, but you know, he's, obviously we can do more with 150,000 troops than we can with 50,000 troops, if, if, if the idea is to, to uh, you know, to, to, to tacitly rearrange the pieces on the ethnic chessboard so that they're in some sort of stable, stable array. I mean, we tried the strategy of withdrawing, you know, reducing our presence, and and we saw the result. The result was ethnic cleansing. So, you know, and, and killing. So, uh, I don't, I don't understand the logic of people who want to go back to that, having it fail, given that it failed before. No, I'm just suspicious of clear-cut scenarios about what will happen in the course of a whole year if we pursue one strategy as opposed to another. It seems to me so far that the system has just proven to be much more chaotic than that and to defy uh, the predictions um, of almost everybody who's making predictions now. Um, uh, okay, but, you know, but what has to make this arguments in conditions of uncertainty? I it's guess. Always, it's always easy to score cheap points by saying, well, hey, you know, things are uncertain. You'll probably be surprised by what happens. That's true. Well, but, I don't always do that. Before the war, I said definitely don't invade, you know. Yeah. That seemed to me a clear-cut situation. But right, now but I, I, right now it's the left that's saying, well, it's better if we leave. And I don't see how they can be certain about that at all. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't see how they can be certain. I don't see how you can be certain. I'm not certain, but all I'm saying is the surge is showing some positive results. There's so could many, be. There's some well, my, my final, my final so, so, thing here is just... Couldn't somebody assemble a really good array of metrics, because you know that would that would help us chart the, the, the direction of things? I have not seen a good summary like this, you know, because there are certain metrics we are keeping track of: number of bodies found in Baghdad, number of Iraqis we know of that have been killed, number of those that we classify as civilians, number of American soldiers killed. And, and, and shouldn't, it, this seems like the kind of thing that a newspaper, you know, newspapers are looking for things they do better than blogs. This would be one. Now, may, maybe there is a site I don't know about that, that lays this all out clearly. But shouldn't that be possible to do it even in a fairly objective fashion? I'm not sure because first, there's a, any, any, even if you could find a metric, there's a lag before you can report it. So we're getting last month metrics and then the, the pro Petraeus people say, yeah, but look what happened last week. The metrics are going down. So there's that, and B, it, it, the metric you want is how many people are willing to to go to war if we withdraw our troops, and and I don't see where there's a metric for that. They 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 could be uh, they, they could be fewer bodies on the street because they're too busy stockpiling weapons for the aftermath of an American withdrawal to kill people now. You, you just don't know. You need a reporter for that. Okay. Uh, well, I'm starting to sweat profusely, and although that's probably just because our air conditioning's not working.
it could be that Iraq is doing that to me. So why don't we move on to, uh, well, this thing you were kind of interested in, the lead and crime thing. Well, as you know, I'm, I'm a believer in the impact of small particles on, hum I know. on human behavior. Uh, and, and the latest, the previous wacky crime theory has been that the Freakonomics theory that uh, it's all, the declining crime was all because of Roe versus Wade, as opposed to uh, Giuliani's uh, broken windows policing theory. Yeah, um, we should maybe flesh that out a little, right? The idea is that... There was a big drop in crime in the 90s. Early 90s, in this, yeah. yeah. And the question is, why did that happen? Did it right. happen because innovative mayors like Rudy Giuliani instituted innovative policing policies that... Uh, under chiefs like Chief Bratton, who's our chief here now in L.A., uh, is it because, uh, you know, somehow conservative social mores just took hold? Is it because the economy got better? Uh, or are there alternative explanations? And the, and the, the most uh, sort of the one that got the most publicity was the Freakonomics explanation that it's because there were fewer unwanted children born because uh, because of the Roe versus Wade uh opening the, the way for legal abortions, that somehow you know, those children would have grown up to be criminals and now they don't. Well, although it is, I don't think it's just that unwanted children tend to grow up to become criminals. I think the idea is that a lot of the families that, you know, statistically you would predict to be most likely to produce criminals, that is to say very low-income families or families living in certain places, they... Isn't that the, lo the logic? I wasn't, it wasn't an argument about unwanted children, the, children, right? The, an the answer is I have. It's, it's, the way I've read it, it's phrased as unwanted children, but... That's but, probably I mean, to avoid the probably, uh, awkward, the politically awkward uh, correct. discussion. Correct. Okay, fair enough. Uh, although I should add, it's not, it's not the case that, that even if you're talking about particular demographics having fewer kids and that reducing the crime rate, it isn't the case that that implies a genetic explanation of crime. Um, no. I mean, we know for a fact that certain demographics are more likely to... It could be a to, class explanation. Of it could be environment yeah. and blah, blah, yeah, blah. blah. Yeah. The, yes. the, and there's a wrinkle on that, too, which a, a reader just pointed out to me, which is um, quite apart from abortion, there was an innovation in birth control technology, Norplant. You know, the teen birth rate has plummeted. The black teen birth rate in particular has been cut in half and is now lower than the Hispanic birth rate for, of teens per thousand. Hmm. And... You know, you talk to doctors and they say, you know, uh, uh, well, that's when Norplant came in. And all of a sudden, everybody started coming to my office and getting Norplant. And, and you know, then they could have sex and not have babies. And that was an appealing technology to them in a way that birth control hadn't been appealing before. And that made all the difference. That could be true. And that could be an alternative explanation to Roe versus Wade. In other words, if you think that teen parents especially have... Uh, uh, bad outcomes for their children. Just postponing birth uh, into into young adulthood maybe had a positive effect on the crime. It's just an alternative that I actually hadn't thought of. Okay. Um, but in any event, the Freakonomics guys, the two two guys who wrote this book and have this blog, right. so we had favored the abortion explanation. Right. And now... And now, now comes this guy, uh, Mr. Nevin, who, uh, in, a, in a sort of puff piece in the Washington Post, proposes the alternative theory, which is that lead abatement led to the uh, decline in crime, and he has correlated uh, the, the, the removal of uh, lead from gasoline and paint with declines in crime 19 years later when those, uh, the, the kids who would otherwise have been exposed to lead during their early years, uh, you know, become old enough to become criminals. Uh, and, and, and a lot of people are very impressed by by, by the correlation, and a lot of, and he also uh, claims to have correlated uh, it in other countries, in eight other countries, uh, the the abatement uh, with with the decline in crime 19 years later. Uh, I, I, I'm not that impressed because you know a one shot, you know, you can come up with a whole bunch of things as as the Freakonomics guy explains on his blog. You can come up with also a whole bunch of things that correlate with just a one shot decline. But then he cites another scholar who claims to have uh, done a regression analysis that compares the result in different states. You know, did they, did, if they abated lead early, did their crime drop early? If they abated lead later, did their crime drop either less or later? Uh, and the, uh, this, 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 this academic claims a very high correlation. 
Uh, and I don't know how to refute that. The one problem I saw with it is, you know, she says, well, we know all the lead leads to crime and leads to ADHD. Uh, yeah, but ADHD hasn't declined, has it? And it's my impression that ADHD is soaring. So if lead is the cause of ADHD and, uh, and lead has been abated, why isn't ADHD abated? Well, but that's a case where the, the diagnostic, uh, I, I think many more people are seeking that diagnosis. Well, that's true, but, but, uh, but you certainly can't uh, conclude from the rise in the diagnosis that the actual underlying disease has declined. I, you know, the, the no, I think we just don't know. The diagnosed I, cases have doubled, so you can't conclude that, well, well it's actually dropped. Uh, but and, I think it well could have. I mean, I mean, because I think what's happening is a lot of people go get the diagnosis to get the medication or whatever. But you know, I, 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 just casual empiricism, Bob. Do you know more screwed up uh, attention uh, deficient kids than before? Yes, I do. You do? I see all these crazy kids all around, yeah. So I don't think it's just the diagnosis. Well, yeah, but that, that could be because they're taking drugs that actually may create the problem. Who knows? A lot of things have changed in the last 20, 30 years. It's possible, but I, I, I sort of doubt it. Um, well, anyway, anyway I mean... So th that's the theory. Okay, so you're skeptical of the lead. Well, you're regrettably skeptical of the lead theory. I'm skeptical. I'm, 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 am I skeptical of the lead theory? I don't know. The Freakonomics guy is skeptical even after citing this academic who claims state-by-state -state correlations. And I thought, right. I mean, the, the Freakonomics guys, you know, they have their, their pre-existing theory to defend, of course. Yeah. I, 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 I thought the Washington Post article discredited itself in the final sentence. Uh, he says, well, many of these kids, first he says, Giuliani's policies are only, uh, only account for 10 or 20 percent of the drop in crime. Well, that's not chopped liver. Second, uh, uh, at the end he says, and many of these kids who were, became criminals because of their exposure to lead were victimized yet again by Giuliani's crime policies. Well, Jesus, look, think of the bias packed into that sentence. First, he says Giuliani reduced crime 10 or 20 percent. So how did it victimize these kids reducing the crime? Didn't it help their neighborhoods? Uh, it's just, it just reflexive sort of anti-Giulianiism. That, and, and, and once you sort of view the whole article retrospectively in that light of this reflexive anti-Julianism, you become very suspicious of it. Okay, well, you sniffed out more liberal media bias. Thank you, Mickey. Well, this is a particularly profound case of liberal media bias, I thought, Bob, and a, and a telling one. And I'm glad that you appreciate it. <laughs> As always. And I would say almost everything you say is profound. I, I don't know why you make that sound unusual. Um... um so anyway, but the bigger the bigger crisis rocking America is is in the realm of athletics, right? Bigger well, than mere crime. Well, so you claim. Um, well, uh, let's uh, you know. Let's look at the evidence. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, I bet you have three. You have to have three pieces of evidence. I think there's more in this case because okay, first of all, in the realm of in baseball, you've got this steroids thing. Where, where, you know, Barry Bonds, any, any moment now is going to break uh, Hank Aaron's career home run right. record. Uh, and everyone knows he did it on the strength of steroids, something that, that Aaron didn't, uh, didn't, didn't apparently employ. The, um, the crazy thing is that Gary Player says that the, the drugs have infested the golf tour. I was going to say, there are more, I mean, in this category alone, of performance enhancing dr drugs, we've got three examples, okay? One is Gary Player saying that weird, kind of ill-advised thing that, he, you know, he's this former great golfing champion, a uh, South African well, guy. What and do, uh, What drugs do golfers take? They don't want to Well, be interestingly, you know, probably, although their physiques have improved a little, I, I think it's probably not steroids because... You would think that that would put them in a the wrong frame of mind to be good golfers yeah. because equanimity is, I, I mean, beta blockers, I don't even know if beta blockers are illegal for them to use prescribed beta blockers. I don't know, but that's what you hear about what do, golfers what using. What do beta but blockers do? They, they, they cure stage fright, classically, and, and, and so they would cure the yips if you're about to, to, to do a five-foot putt for, for the U.S. Open well, why or something. shouldn't they be able to cure the yips? They should be. I, look, everyone says beta blockers... If they have no other adverse side effects on, you know, vigor or quickness or anything, you know, would be all upside for a golfer. You hear, you hear about it all the time. I, I assume they would be taking something like that. I'm not sure that's illegal. I don't know. But it's something golf, I think, doesn't want to get into. Right. Okay. Well, anyway, sorry. Sorry to sidetrack you. I, I don't know what other things you might uh, 
you know, there, there might, it, uh, it, who knows what. It, it just seems to me if there's, if there's no side effects to abuse of beta blockers by ambitious teen golfers, you know, if it's just like aspirin, go ahead, take it. What's the you problem? would think they would, yes. But why should it be a scandal? It's, it's like. Oh, I don't, I don't even know what Gary Player had in mind. There may be other drugs. It's like, you know, I rely on drugs to do blogging heads. I'm, I'm taking drugs. You drink coffee? I'm taking drugs right now, yeah. Well, you know, when I, in Little League in like 1969 or something, right before the All-Star game, when we were going to, on the bus to San Anselmo in Northern California, our coach passed out Hershey bars because he told us they would, they told us they would give us quick energy. That's such a mistake. What? That's such a mistake because then when the sugar leaves, you become exhausted. Well, it wasn't just the sugar, though. Chocolate has uh, both caffeine and, and a second stimulant. Mike but um, Mike anyway, passed that orange anyway, that's, that's what uh, that's what put me on the path to ruin and uh, moral relativism. The uh, so anyway, that's one set of scandals uh, is 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 performance enhancing drugs. Then meanwhile, you've got in, in the NFL, uh, great quarterback Michael Vick turns out was apparently running this dog fighting uh, thing and. Well, that, if that weren't kind of... Uh, that's, that, that's sort of a side issue. I mean, you know, he, he wasn't convicted of any sort of corruption that had to do with his performance on the field. And, True. Uh, and, uh, you know, of all, the, of all the crimes, you know, football players commit, for some reason this strikes me as the most benign. He didn't rape anybody. Although this may have the most long-lasting consequences for the perpetrator. I mean, first of all, he's being, you know, I think he's been indicted, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is serious, serious business. Yes, and agree. secondly, what he's accused of doing really grosses people out in a way that they don't forgive it the way they forgive steroid juice, I think. I mean, so with steroid juice, you think, well, you know, if I was there and it was either go to the minor leagues or take these steroids, it would be sorely tempting, right? right. Whereas this guy allegedly not only... You know, bred these dogs, sponsored these these uh, these dog fights, had dozens of dogs on this property, and but but uh, allegedly, the unsuccessful dogs he would kill in gratuitously cruel manners, like electrocuting them. Um. Uh, so th it, there was a. This was a. It sounds like it was a seriously sadistic operation. Right, right, right. Almost nobody thinks that that's highly forgivable behavior. I think. No, right, now, but it's, it's just not an indictment of sports. It's by No, it's, it, it's not a corruption of the sport per se, although some people have said that there are that he is not the only NFL player who will be shown to be involved in this. So it could spread further in the sport, but it's not a corruption of sports per se. No, there's a dog-fighting subculture in the NFL, apparently, yes. Could be. Yeah. But now, the third thing is actually different from both of these. It's a corruption of professional basketball, but not via a player, rather via an official, this official uh, Tim something, who is accused of both betting on games and officiating in a way that would influence the final score of games to help, well, presumably both himself and other bettors who, who paid him off. Right, and now allegedly his life has been threatened by some of those, presumably some of the uh, bettors he was involved in. Oh, you mean if he talks he dies? Yeah, I think he's about to talk. He's or not, depending on whether he hears you say that. But, um, um, but no, this is, uh, you know, he's, he's allegedly under federal protection now. The, uh -huh. uh, yeah, but still, who wants I mean, to live your life in the witness protection program, I must admit, right? You know, I think sports are important. Sports teach valuable lessons. Uh, professional sports I don't care that much for. So if professional sports are considered corrupt and people start rooting on for college sports, so much the better. That's well, my yeah, policy but implication of all this. How about that? What's that? What was that last I've thing? I've drawn a policy, uh, an upbeat policy implication from your... Well, okay, but scandal. first of all, on, on the steroids front, one of the arguments against letting pro players use steroids, and there are people who say just let it all flow. I, I think Malcolm Gladwell has made this right, argument. Right, right, right. Um, one of the arguments against it is the trickle-down effect. In other words, if some of these if some of these things are bad right. for you, as steroids people, can be. If people care less about professional basketball because, hey, the games are fixed anyway, and that causes attendance to plummet, and people concentrate more on college basketball, where steroids are not that all you know are less important, presumably they're still important. Well, there um, have been betting scandals in college. The classic one is in the fifties, the point shaving scandal. But right. So, I guess that's right. I guess anywhere people pay attention, there's going to be betting. 
any, anywhere money is bet, there are people who want to corrupt things. Right. But the but but what I was I was mo- what I was saying was I, I was kind of maybe making one too many transitions. I was saying in the realm of steroids, one of the best arguments against the pro use is that if it's a, a, accepted as a way to become a professional athlete then for every one pro athlete, there's a thousand aspiring college athletes who will say, well, well, if it's a legitimate ticket to the pros, I'll give it a try. And for every one college athlete, there's a thousand high school athletes who hope to get, you know, a college scholarship and so on. No, so I buy that logic if it, if it has adverse health effects, which I think steroids do. So, Right, and although I wouldn't mind the damage done to this very small number of pro athletes in itself, the point is it would ha- it tends right. to have this trickle-down effect. Right. I'm not going to argue with you on that. I'm just, um, uh, what am I saying? I was looking for the silver lining, and I failed to find it. No, I think you found it for a second, and I distracted you. Um, I don't think so, uh, because if people pay attention to college games, then they'll fix yeah. the college games. Right, whatever they're, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Whatever they're paying attention to, they'll bet on, and, and betting will tend to but, corrupt. But although, although they won't make as much money, so the so financial incentive for kids to dope themselves up will be decreased. There you go. Yeah, the other thing is, um, you know, there's actually, there's no evidence that there's been very much of, of this, and, and there's no evidence that it's a growing kind of trend. I mean, I mean, the whole steroids, performance-enhancing drug things, that is a growing you know, conundrum, policy and moral conundrum, because there's just going to be more and more of that stuff. Right, right. And, and so that is, that is actually something to wrestle with. In the realm of gambling, there's no evidence. I mean, every once in a while one of these scandals happens. It goes back to the, the Black Sox and Shoeless Joe Jackson 100 years ago, and, uh, and there's no evidence that it's growing. Well, and, in fact, I mean, it's, it may be true that because of technology there's more online money being bet and more incentive to do this, but... There's an interesting piece in the Washington Post today that implied that there would actually be the basketball that all sports could do a much better uh, job of policing these things. What they did was, I mean, they didn't say it that way, but what they did was go back and showed that the the evidence was there were there was suggestive evidence about this guy all along if you had looked for it. Okay. Because if you looked at games he had officiated, if you just follow the betting line in Vegas or wherever it's legal to, to compile the betting line, in games he officiated, the initial betting line changed more than average after it was set. Okay? So in other words, large sums of money came in asymmetrically right. after the initial betting line had been set. The other thing they could do is apparently a lot of these bets are bets on the total points scored. Yeah, uh, and there's a correlation between the number of fouls called and total points scored because the way the rules are currently, if you call a lot of fouls, people go to the free throw line a lot, and that actually boosts the score. Right, um, that was also in the Washington could, Post they, piece. They could first ban that second that second sort of bet if that's possible, and second, change the rules so that more fouls don't correlate with more points scored, but in fact, you um, you you know you penalize the team in other ways that don't involve adding points. Well, basketball needs that anyway. Uh, I yeah. mean, so I mean, the, it, so I mean, the, the whole last quarter of an NBA game isn't it like a litany of fouls, and you don't understand why they're calling all these fouls, and now right. you, I mean, ba- now basketball, you really wonder why they're calling all these fouls, and they they just need to change the rules. Basketball is one of the few sports in which the incentive structure is such that you often want to get caught breaking the rules. In effect, you want to foul someone, you want, you know, you want you want there to be a penalty that is seen and punished. Now, obviously, you need to alter your incentive structure if that's the case, especially if it's leading to these really boring, drawn-out conclusions of, of games. Uh, well, well, rather these were in than, cases, uh, these were in cases of intentional fouls. These are cases well, of, of unintentional fouls that are called by the ref trying to run up the score. They are, but I'm just saying there's a separate reason. The no, intentional think... fouls are enough of a problem with the game, just kind of aesthetically, that... But it, they, they need to change the incentive structure anyway. Intentional have been an interesting part of basketball ever since I've been playing them. Of course, I grew up in the era of lead, so maybe I, you know, maybe I have clouded metal faculties. But it seems to me that, uh, you know, one's always, you always foul people in the last quarter in, in an attempt to slow things down and, and uh, yeah, hold it, it to a, a free throw. Right, and, and there are remotely comparable things in, in other sports, uh, but... It's like pulling the goalie. It's, it's, it's not an uninteresting thing to preserve. It's just you don't want it to go overboard. Yeah, it's not quite like pulling the goalie. I mean, it's like wanting to get caught doing something that's against the rules. But 
Right. And that's really not that common in sports, but uh, outside of basketball, I in, think. But in general, in pro basketball, they just don't let the game play enough. I mean, they it's, it's sort of heavily whistled. I think maybe I'm crazy. They don't let what? The, the the last quarter is too much controlled by the whistle usually, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway. The, uh, I, no, I think you're, I think there's too many whistles in the last quarter. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Partly because of intentional fouls. Yeah. Um, anyway, we've settled well, that. So wait, so we think the world is not in crisis because of this this stuff? No. Although, okay. This is a particularly damning scandal for professional basketball. It's 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 you know. Yeah, but I think this one is isolated. Whereas the the the, the, the drug thing is going to grow and grow, and they're going to have to figure out something to do. And and. Sports, I, I think, are going to, the pro sports are just going to have to, you know, if they're going to say that this stuff is illegal, they're going to have to have rigorous testing and severe penalty, uh, because otherwise, if they do it halfway, they're just going to be in this chronic state of embarrassment, you know, where they don't really deter the behavior, they're, and they're always generating this uh, evidence that it's pervasive. They're going to have to bust the union. There's a neoliberal policy implication. There you go. Okay. Uh, I've become a pathetic cliche. Uh, no, you haven't. Okay. But you know, hey, by the way, did you did you know that you know your 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 neoliberal blog gets so many plaudits? Two, two things. Uh, one is, um, I guess you knew this that that somebody asked one of the White House press people. And I don't, I don't think it was Tony Snow, but somebody, what blogs are read in the White House in the White House or something? And they mentioned like three and yours was one. Is that true? That was Dan Barta. That was months ago. Are you proud of that? He's he subsequently left. Hmm. Do you think that was a coincidence? <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, but so you did that mean George Bush himself reads Cows Files? I doubt that. I doubt that too. Does it have pictures? Do you have pictures on your blog? No, I don't have pictures yet. Okay, but there's this other plaudit. Um, but this one's very suspicious. Did you see this where James Taranto, who, as you probably know, you know who he is? He's a friend of mine. That's why, probably why he said he read my blog. Right. It certainly is not because he actually read it. And you know what evidence I have of this? He's the editor of OpinionJournal.com, and somewhere they were asking people what blogs they read. Favorite blogs. He mentions three, and one is CowsFiles.com. You know how we know that he doesn't really read it, Mickey? No. I think okay, he... here's his description. In parentheses, a short parenthetical description of each blog. After years, it says, in parentheses, Slate's prolific political blogger. <laughs> what word doesn't really apply, Mickey? Yeah, I thought that was a little weird, too. Yeah, that's kind of like, I mean, you know in those World War II movies where they would try to figure out who was a German spy by saying, those New York Yankees are sure a great football team. Yeah. You know, and if the guy nods his head, he's the guy. I mean, you could do something like this to see who really doesn't. You say that Mickey Kaus is sure a prolific blogger. I'm not prolific as a blogger, but I'm more prolific than I was before I was a blogger. If that makes any sense. No, it does. I post three items a day, whether you know, on average, which is very low for a blogger, but uh, but high for me. So there you go. It's high quality stuff, anyway. No, it's not. No, it I'm is. I'm phoning it in now. It's summer. It'll get well, better. Well, anyway, it's it's historically high quality. Okay, thank you. Um, so wait, what else, uh, what else? Oh, village elder. You wanted to ridicule this village elders concept? Well, you want, you, you had some Harry Potter thing you wanted to make. Oh, Harry Potter. Whoa, and time is running out. Um, I'm not sure I have anything profound to say. I mean, I mean, it struck me. This is going to, wait, first, spoilers, right? You're about to spoil the book for millions of children. No. You're not gonna, about to reveal the ending of Harry Potter? No. Okay, go ahead. I could. No, don't. Go ahead. Uh, but not because I've read it, just because of what I hear. Um, no, it just occurred that there were these two massive cultural phenomena with, with an ardent following that just reached their conclusion. The Sopranos, Harry Potter. And I had not paid the slightest attention to either of them. Right. I don't, I don't like, have time to really read, and, and I don't get HBO. So I did this, this makeup thing where I went back and got the DVD and watched the first two episodes of The Sopranos and watched the first Harry Potter movie. Yeah. And so that's my level of familiarity with them. And I was going to use that as a basis for a little compare and contrast thing. Well, do you have any deep points to make? I was kind of hoping you would handle that part. I haven't seen either of them. 
You have nothing to say about them? No, I know how Harry Potter ends, because I read about it in Slate magazine. But uh, Don't spoil it. I won't spoil it, but uh, I think you were no. going to rag on the inconclusive nature of the surprise, which is obvious to me. It's all about setting it up so they can either do a movie or, uh, you know, some sort of comeback. So they can't kill Tony off, because then they couldn't come back. Uh, and it's all set up so they can make more money. And that's the explanation. It didn't end because they don't want it to end. They want another payday. Uh, Actually. And, 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 and why isn't this simple, crude Marxist explanation for why it was a, you know, a lousy ending so much better than all the other explanations? Actually, I, I, from what little I've read about, is it James Chase, the creator and driving force? Yes. Something like I, that. I, I think he's a little more of an artiste than you're giving him credit for. I, I really do. I mean, I'm about to make some criticisms of the show, or one tentative criticism, but... Uh, no, I'm sure he says that's not what he's up to, but, you know, but there are other people involved, <laughs> including a whole bunch of studios that have a lot of money to make, and a whole bunch of actors who have a lot of money to make, and, you know, uh, we know that financial motives have a way of subconsciously working on even the greatest artists. Huh. I hadn't thought of that. But go ahead. Uh, I'm waiting for it to work on me. Uh, so am I. Uh, the, um, well, he, but here's my, I mean, my question watching the first two episodes of The Sopranos is, is this really a good use of somebody's talent? I mean, it, I felt about it a little the way I felt about Pulp Fiction, you know, which is that, very well done, talented person behind it. Uh, but and, and I laughed at Pulp Fiction. I, I, I liked it, but but I really felt uncomfortable laughing at some of the things because uh, of the extent to which you were laughing at highly graphic violence. And I wondered, is that really good for us? Is that really good for people? You know, and does it lead to an overly casual attitude uh, toward things like uh, violent death? And and with The Sopranos, I had somewhat the same reaction. Uh, because that's that's what you're. I mean, you, I you're dealing with these people who themselves take it very lightly, and that's supposed to be part of the joke, right? Boy, you I laugh the, at how they laugh at, at at unjust death. I saw the last episode of The Sopranos, and I didn't think anybody was taking any violence lightly at all. Well, uh, actually, I, the, the, the guy was terrified of dying. He was worried that the cat was a foreboding of of of, of his imminent violent death, and he wasn't too happy about it. Yeah, see, I think the tenor of the thing changed over time, and apparently the characters grew less sympathetic. What struck me, uh, well, I'm not sure about that, but I think, I think I've heard that, but, but what struck me about the beginning episodes was how you, you absolutely were drawn into sympathizing with monsters, you know, and, and you were, they, they were successfully humanized. You thought, well, these are real people, they're like me, they have hopes and fears and dreams, and... It kind of worked at that level, but my, my feeling was, you know, they're, they're, if you're really good at humanizing people in this fashion who are not normally thought of as human beings, maybe there are groups of people somewhere on the planet that you could more usefully do that with than gangsters. I, I don't see any kind of redeeming value in really emphasizing the human side of gangsters. I'm sorry. I just think you should lock them up. Uh, like but, Arab terrorists, for example. Well, actually, that's an interesting comparison. I mean... You know, it is arguably the case that to that that a solution to terrorism could be abetted by more clearly understanding the conditions that lead people to sympathize with terrorism. Okay, so that's at least possible. Well, I thought. Did you see the movie that that, that oil movie uh, that Stephen Gagan did, Syriana? No. Oh, he tries to do that for for Arab terrorists, and it's the best part of the movie. Unfortunately, well, I mean, unfortunately I, the movie itself completely falls apart because he says everything is a plot by American oil companies. But the parts that go into like how the making of a young terrorist who winds up at the end, you know, about to blow up an American ship, uh, that was a useful exercise, I thought. Yeah, well, at, at least in general, I would say terrorism is the kind of problem where you can imagine it being the case that a, a solution to the problem would be facilitated by having a clear understanding of what thing, what the world looks like from the people who are finding the terrorism attractive. I, you know, I could draw that out, but, but in a way it's an argument we've had a lot of times and, 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 and I needn't. But the, in the realm of gangsterism, I mean, I just don't... 
you know, I, I don't, I, I, I really don't see any reason to go beyond a lock 'em up strategy here. I'm sorry. I think, uh, uh, Ann Coulter would say you have sympathy for terrorists, and she'd say I just had sympathy for terrorists. Yeah, but but she won't say that, and she already did say the first thing, yeah, and that's the difference. Say, she might say that. Um. um uh, so I don't know. I mean, whereas Harry Potter. Uh, Seems to me pretty innocuous, maybe not outright good, but from what little I know about it, it seems like a fine way for people to spend time. But do you do you have an understand uh, an explanation for the Harry Potter phenomenon? No, I started to read it, and it seemed like such a mediocre book that I couldn't get through it. But I do that with a lot of books. Right, but 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 millions of adults differ, and and that I mean the key to its success is that it managed to appeal to both adults and children, and and that and I guess I'd have to read the books to figure out how it did that. Um, it just seems like a case of winner-take-all marketing to me, but hey, what do I yeah, know? Yeah, but on an, on an unprecedented scale. Correct. And right. I think the key was those two levels. Uh, it always is. Well, but it's rarely done, and certainly rarely done like this, right? But Hollywood does it all the time. Appeal to both kids and parents. Yeah, isn't that the genius of Pixar? Pixar, yep. Well, there you go. Um, yep. Was there one time I wanted to ridicule you about the elders? You wanted to ridicule the elders, first of all. Well, but you said you were somehow connected to this shadowy group. I can tell that of, story, but first you have to ridicule them. Okay, first there's we this have group, to explain what they are. There's this group of ten world leaders that were organized by Richard Branson of Virgin Airways and Peter Gabriel, the rock musician, uh, to, and they're going to function as village elders for the global community. And they include all the usual suspects, uh, Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, Jimmy Carter, uh, Kofi Annan. Uh, if Father Hesburgh was alive, he would be in the group, too. Um, and it's like, it's like, you know, it's like the VIP section of the Aspen Institute, okay? And they're going to go around the world and help resolve uh, global, con resolve conflicts, uh, because as... Uh, Richard Branson says, these people are above ego. Uh, they're above what? Above ego. They don't have egos. Jimmy Carter doesn't oh, good. have ego. And they're above oh, partisan politics. That's why every time you hear Jimmy Carter talk at a Democratic convention, it's the most crude, viciously partisan uh, speech you've ever seen. Um, uh, but these uh, uh, selfless people are going to travel around the world uh, solving conflicts. And I'm, I'm you know... It doesn't sound intrinsically awful, because where it doesn't work, it won't work. But it does seem uh, a little smug and self-satisfied. Could be. Well, anyway, I mean, you, 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 you discovered this independent of me and sent me the link I, suggesting... I read it on the blog Influence Peddler, which uh, ridiculed it as Peter Gabriel's group of bizarro super friends. To the Eldermobile, there's a conflict somewhere. Yeah, I would say that that blog ridiculed it in somewhat cruder terms than you, you've used. This. But the group, this is a quote, but the group is formed of morons whose answers to conflict in the past seems to have been for those in the right, for those in the right to step aside and let evil run wild. Well, first of all, I don't think Jimmy Carter's a moron. I don't think that's a problem. I don't think you'd call Nelson Mandela a moron. Uh, and moreover, I think actually Nelson Mandela found a non-belligerent, non-vindictive solution to a very dicey problem that a lesser person would have mishandled by being more more vindictive and, and belligerent, okay? Would you agree with that? I agree, although his wife, I believe, was married to the dictator of Mozambique who tortured poor Teresa Hines Carey. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Wait, his wife? Not tortured physically, but it, Teresa Hines Carey has all sorts of vicious, nasty things, probably accurate things to say about how corrupt and awful the Michelle Go Frelimo government was in Mozambique. And she was the first lady of the Forlivo government in Mozambique. So she's one of these great elders who's going to travel the world solving problems. Oh, oh, oh Mandela's current wife? Yeah, Grasa Michelle. I know nothing about that she's... and cannot comment on it. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Also, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, I'm sorry, his answers to conflict haven't always been to step aside. I mean, actually, he, he's the one who started, you know, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, he, A, we boycotted the Olympics, and as moderate as that may sound... That he was calling for a greater, more widespread sacrifice on the part of Americans who would love to watch their teams in the Olympics and their athletes, 
than George Bush has well, called for in the course of this whole Iraq and war. And it was a nonviolent action that had a big effect. So I'm not, it was, I'm, but he I'm, also I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But he also began the covert intervention in Afghanistan, which of course has come back to haunt us, the, supplying the the uh, uh, the mujahideen with arms and organizing them and so on. But that actually started in the Carter administration. That was not a passive response. It was. It turns out maybe it was not well advised either, but it was not passive. Nor was his abortive Iran hostage rescue attempt. It was just incompetent. That was incompetent. <laughs> um, anyway, oh well. Okay, my con my connection is I got this email months ago, and it told me about this elders thing and said, "Do you want to come to this organizing conference in London?" And uh, you know, all expenses paid and everything. And I was briefly under the illusion that I I might have a chance of becoming one of the elders. I mean, I hadn't I, well, I didn't the, read the email really very the clearly. Nice young Bob, there's an email <laughs> form on the elders' site where you can nominate future elders. So I was and, taking. And I mean, I'm unlike the actual elders, I have an ego. So I was like taking this ego bath, right? Thinking, oh, imagine me, global village elder, and uh, you know, still having not read the email, I thought about the implications of this, and I thought, wait a second, what if I could get, like, a free trip to London for my whole family instead of just me? So we communicated about this, <laughs> and it turns out I could, yes, I could turn in my business class ticket for four coach class tickets, and, and, all, and they would get their hotel fare, or their hotel cost paid. And then I discovered that actually I was not, an, <laughs> I was not eligible to be an elder. I was, this group was going to meet and kind of set guidelines, kind, kind of, kind of, kind of lay out ideas for what kinds of things elders should do or something. Well, this what? was an elder advisory council. That seems pretty prestigious. I was game. I was game. So why did you go? My family caught the flu like two days before. Uh, uh, that's so tragic. You could have it, been, it really was. You could have been a, a global peacemaker. I could have been on the advisory council I mean, to the Global Village Elders. Richard but anyway, Branson, I, I'm less cynical than you are. Um, Richard Branson has his enterprises, and you have blogging heads. You're both tycoons. I thought we'd be rubbing elbows. But I think he was actually not even going to be present at this thing, it turns out. Um, but go ahead. Sorry I interrupted. Well, it is, it is just an interesting question. I mean, certainly societies larger than villages have had, in effect, kinds of elders, right? Which is to say widely respected wise people. Yeah. Isn't that true? Yes. And as, as you know, the blogging community, you know, it's the well, whippersnappers like Ezra Klein looked up to their elders, you know. Like you. With more reverence, that might be a good thing. Yeah. Um, but like Walter Cronkite, they say that, you know, the, the Vietnam War was effectively over when he came out against it, right? Such was his... Yeah, although he was sort of a fake elder. I wouldn't make him an elder. The, well, I'm wondering if there ever have been real elders. But, but if there have been, then you might, you know, I mean, if there have been elders on a national level, you might hope that someday there would be elders who, who, who had respect on a global level. Now, it may be that, that it's the kind of thing that has to happen in a kind of bottom-up, bubbling-up way rather than, like several people anointing them, but anyway. The problem is that these people don't acquire constituencies of fan base that they're going to have to please. So Jimmy Carter has a sort of, uh, you know, let's cut Israel down to size fan base. And uh, the, the, it becomes difficult for him to actually function in, uh, freely if he wants to maintain his popularity, no? I mean, he can't, he can't all of a sudden turn on the Arabs and, and say, okay... It's your turn to make concessions. That's sort of not what. Oh, I think Jimmy these Carter people are subject want. to the normal, normal human uh, controls. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, but that would be true of everyone who has ever been an actual village elder well, or, or wise person, right? I mean, everyone has a constituency. If they're an elder with a with a well publicized constituency, the elders that I, the people that I've turned to with elders, have all been sort of hidden experts. You know, there was a guy in the state Supreme Court who, who was just really wise, and when you had a problem, you went to him. Hmm. You know, and, 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 and there are people in Washington who are really wise, and you go to them when you have a problem. Lloyd Cutler, bizarrely, after being like, uh, you know, after advising Jimmy Carter on various things, I think toward the end of his life, actually functioned as an elder. You went to him, you know, I, my three interactions with him, he was genuinely wise. Uh, huh. You know, uh, so, you know, so there. So there. But um, uh, he's normally someone one would mock. Anyway, uh, but so I, I think the publicity, it's the publicity that's the key that traps them. And this is just going to give them more publicity. So, therefore, it's a bad thing. 
Well, I, always, I will say that back when I was thinking I was going to go advise the advisory council or whatever I was going to do, the first thing I was going to say is you realize that this idea will be widely ridiculed, right? I mean, you can always ask Nelson Mandela to intervene. Right. All the, all the elders thing is that there's a Virgin Airways plane gassed up and ready to take him. You know, and then I guess the argument is he was ready to intervene it with Saddam, and, he, and he, you know, the war started before he could get on the plane. But, yeah. you know, he wasn't about to talk Saddam into stepping down. So, But Mandela himself has got to be a uniquely good candidate for this, right? I mean, I mean, you're right. Jimmy Carter has his distinctly partisan identity. Although and, and Mandela, no doubt, has his detractors in South Africa well, especially, but on a global level. Isn't the dirty little secret that South Africa isn't as successful as people think it is? And shouldn't he spend more time? More well, I think it has real problems, yeah. I think it has real problems. It, the, what he's credited with is avoiding the, the retributive bloodbath, right. I think. Right, um, uh, Maybe he should focus... I, I don't know. What is his relation with Mugabe? Maybe he should, uh, he should take a jet plane to... I don't know, but Kofi Annan, who is also on this council, right? He's a village elder, a global village elder. Yeah. Uh, I think just dissed Mugabe, like today I heard something on BBC about him saying, you know, the, the, the Zimbabwe thing is uh, intolerable, huh. I think. Okay, well, there so is there. this tendency of, of you know, uh, getting to yes, okay, we'll kill half the Jews, then the Jews will be happy and Hitler will be happy. And this sort of, this enterprise sort of reeked a bit of that. Anything yeah. to avoid conflict. Conflict is always bad. Well, sometimes conflict is necessary. Well, moreover... Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes conflict is just hard to resolve. <laughs> it isn't just a... Yeah. Um, no, I have some of your reservations, and yet not all of your cynicism. That's the way I'd summarize okay. my position. Well, that's, uh, you know, Richard, that's the difference between you and Richard Branson. Richard Branson is building empires, and you're worrying whether you can convert a first-class ticket into four coach tickets. Yeah, but, it's, but beyond, when you get beyond that, I think we have a lot in common. It's the level at which you operate. Yeah. Um, did you want to do so, comments? Do we have time? Well, yeah, a little. I mean, I mean, uh, just in the, in, the, in the house cleaning realm. First of all, I should apologize. The, the new form, the flash format, has not been deployed. As I said, it might well be by this time. And now, our tech guru Greg Dingle has just gone on vacation. We wouldn't dare introduce a new technical feature without him there to handle crises. Um, so that's a little bit of ways. Uh, among the virtues of that, of course, when we have it, is that anyone will be able to create a Dingle link. And, Mickey, can I just give a little Dingle Link sermon here? Encourage commenters to use Dingle Links? Yes, although if you have to give a Dingle Link ser sermon, that, that troubles me. That implies that not enough people are using Dingle Links. Well, some are. Named after Dingle, by the way. Named after Greg Dingle. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think, actually, Nate recently intervened and reprimanded people for not using Dingle Links more often, and it had some limited effect. I think a few week, weeks ago, I think it was Nate, but, but let me, the perils of not using them are the following. I mean, first of all, it'll often be much clearer to people reading the comments what the hell you're talking about if you make specific reference to the part of the video you're watching, you're, you're talking about. And here, here's an Which example. Which is what a Dingle Link enables you to do. It's what a, a Dingle Link enables you to do. Absolutely. To, it's like go right, quoting print. Go right to the part that you want to link to, yes. Okay, go ahead. And here's the kind of calamities you could avoid with a dingling. Now, I rarely delete comments. I've done it a few times, especially when people make seemingly gratuitous uh, comments about people's appearance or ethnicity, although my appearance and ethnicity you're, of course, free to comment on. Um, I deleted one the other day that, had it included a dingling, I would not have deleted. And what it was, it started out with just very obscene word, and then it had seeming gibberish thereafter, and I thought, what is this, and deleted it. Then I listened to the dialogue uh, involving Josh Cohen and Brink Lindsay, and it turns out that Josh Cohen had uttered the obscenity, and this was actually an arguably clever, in any event, not totally gratuitous, comment on what Josh said. Now, if it had had a dingle link, I would have said, oh, I see where you're coming from, you know, but it didn't. That's and a he, tragedy, but... I, dingle links are very helpful. That what, the one thing that, that I, 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 I haven't mastered is you can link not only to the beginning of the video segment you want to link to, but you can also have it end. So you, yeah. can, you can link to like a 10-second segment. And right, it, and in fact, one thing that's been holding up deployment of the Flash player is, uh, is that specific property. Huh. 
Wh I mean, I see, Flash, Windows Media and Real had this thing built in. We didn't have yeah. to do anything. You have to, you have to build your own yeah, special... Okay. Uh, Anyway, I haven't mastered this, but other people are more in depth, and, 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 and it's really is very efficient if you can just link to like ten seconds. Totally. But another problem has been that it did not work for people using Macs or people using Firefox okay. unless they downloaded a plugin. So okay. that will all be solved in the glorious future that okay. awaits us after first Flash uh, is implemented and then the the glorious redesign is unveiled. Um, on, on this same subject. One of the drawbacks of Flash is that we had to reduce the number of available fast speeds to basically one. And I said 1.3 times normal speed is what we settled on. I think that's about right. Well, right, but then Blog and Noggin complains that he uses 1.5, and then Travis 68 seconds the motion and says, quote, you guys, that would be people like you and me, Mickey, you guys actually sound smart at 1.5. 1.3, not so much. Well, so we don't sound smart. I, I, 1.3 seems about right. I, you can't let blog and noggin boss you around, man. Be a man. Okay. Thank, thanks for putting that uh, that steel in my spine. I mean, I like um, blog and noggin, but, you know, he just, I do too. he's just half of our fan base. <laughs> what about the other half? Yeah, he's the Kantian half. Um, anyway, we may bump it up to 1.4. That's the kind of, you know, mealy mouth, mushy That's good. That's being responsive. I am. That's being responsive. People will appreciate that. Okay. So that wins your approval. Uh, quickly, one, one other viewer email from Clem Kadiddler raises the question of whether that's a, a reference to the old Red Skelton character, uh, Clem Kadiddlehopper, or, or just like some sort of cheap sexual innuendo. But anyway, he or she writes, I'm getting increasingly pissed off at Bob's irrational suggestions that frisking Muslims at airports will lead to terrorism. Is there some extremist-leaning Muslim out there whose ideology is so flimsy that an extra frisk will cause him to become a terrorist? Uh, the motivations for Muslims to become terrorists is plentiful enough that I don't think frisking will change anyone's mind. Al-Qaeda believes that Israel is massacring Palestinians, that the United States is giving them the weaponry to do it. Is that not motivation enough? The idea that Muslims will be so enraged by extra screening at airports that they will become terrorists I, I, is more I, worthy I, paranoia, I had, paranoia. I had some of the same thoughts. I mean, uh, what encourages terrorists more, Israel or frisking at airports it, by a factor of about a million to one, uh, the state of Israel-Palestinian relations uh, encourages people to become terrorists. So why are you all, uh, all going crazy about uh, a, a, a very efficient, uh, cost-effective profiling at airports? Well, uh, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the Israel issue has different resonance in different parts of the Muslim world. I'm sure it has some here. Uh, I'm not sure it has as much as it does in other places. In any event, unlike you, I just think these things, making, making Muslims feel persecuted in America, have a, have a big effect. That's my estimation. Yours is that they don't, and that's no point in the data is so elusive uh, that it's, it's hard to carry the conversation on much further. I would direct people and will link to a piece in Slate uh, by a guy who carries this to much kind of subtler depths, I think, uh, and argues that, that when we do, th you know, we, there's all this talk about the radical uh, Muslim population in, uh, in Europe as compared to the, the, the much more moderate population in America. He said we're making some of the mistakes they made in Europe, and, and he cites things like, uh, you know, infiltrating mosques. He said Europe started doing that long in, uh, ago, and that really was a big antagonist for uh, for Muslims there. So anyway, I'll link to that piece. And, 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 and in general, I would say that, that ethnic profiling is just kind of an icon of the whole issue of how careful you should be in doing things that make Muslims feel persecuted and making them feel not politically empowered <clears throat> to protest what they see as persecution and so on. All I would say... Uh, jumping in, in, in my defense in that particular exchange in the comments was B-Rad, who then in a separate post, by the way, brought up the question of whether blogging heads TV doesn't uh, increase social isolation. You and I were talking about how uh, the iPhone may do that. Increases my social isolation. But You mean when you do it or when you don't? When I do it. I, I beg to differ. And, and I would contend that, that this is one website that's trying to be, at least, not terribly ideologically homogeneous, you know, somewhat 
diverse, uh, and so and, and, and trying to overcome that natural tendency of some of these technologies to be socially segmenting. Um, but speaking of which, there was a shortly before uh, we did this, um, there was a dialogue taped featuring uh, another voice from the right. You'll be happy to hear, Mickey. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Does the phrase "axis of evil" mean anything to you? You're at David Fromon. Apparently. I mean, uh, he was last seen having trouble uploading, but if, if, assuming we got over that. Oh, that's yes. He's a smart guy. That's good. I know he's a smart guy. You had been encouraging this. Great. Uh, but it, it's, it's uh, you know, Neocon Love Fest uh, with, with Eli Lake, apparently, to counterbalance all the, these, these too many liberal love fests. Oh, you don't want him in a love fest. What? You don't want him in a love fest. That's your failing as, as blogging heads are. Yeah, I know. No, but his next stop... His next stop will be to have to confront somebody, uh, you know, uh, less yes. hospitable, like me, maybe. I found if, if he's willing. He's somebody you can argue with. I'm all for him. I agree. Um, perhaps a little too uh, impressed with Mr. Chalabi. Perhaps a little what? Too impressed with Mr. Chalabi. Well, this was a common failing several <laughs> years ago. Um, but uh, but there you go. But he will he he will be quite open about it. He won't he won't. You won't well, anyway, I'm now drenched in sweat as, as the air conditioning continues not to function here. So Okay, well, we've gone an hour and 50 minutes, and I can't believe anybody has stayed for the whole thing. So. No, that's not the idea, is it? I thought, I thought it was just for you and me to chat. It is, yeah. But, you know, well, anyway. there's <laughs> Now, go ahead. I, you know, part of the idea of, of blogging and blogging heads is that discussions <clears throat> will be open so people can see how... Decisions and evolve, and there's nothing secret. And uh, I, I, I just learned that uh, uh, the, our whippersnapper friend Ezra Klein has has gotten together a secret email list of sort of liberals like Paul Glasters and Jonathan Chait and Mark Kleiman, and they all email to each other, uh, you know, and not publicly, not on the web, but in secret. Uh, and I don't know, seems contrary to the spirit of the web. Well, I'll, you, I'll let you settle that with him. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't quite get it. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> there is a lot of natural transparency in contemporary technology, but that doesn't mean people are not allowed to have private conversations, no, right? I mean, I you and I have had, have had phone whole, conversations, you wanna, right? You don't want to create a whole separate, like, private blog that only the elite bloggers can go into, and then you, what you present, present to the public is sort of the propaganda you've decided uh, mm -hmm. to go public with. I mean, yes, of course, I get emails, like, I, I, you know, I say, look... You know, is Mayor Villaraigosa about to get busted for another affair? I don't know. I would never publish that, you know. But but having it, but at some point it becomes big enough that it becomes uh, to sort of that's where the real conversation takes place and the public isn't in on it. And that's what I think is is uh, contrary to the spirit of the blogosphere. What, well, maybe you should debate this question on blogging heads with Ezra Klein, Mickey. I'm coming around to that. Are you? Slowly. Whoa. I'm going to email Ezra. No, don't do that. But anyway. But I still won't be part of his special email list, apparently. Apparently not. I thought this would trigger your um, your fears. My competitive uh, ire. Your insecurities, yeah. Oh, my, my insecurities are always in, in fifth gear. Don't worry. Okay, well, they're, they're talking, and you're not invited to the party, Bob. I'm never invited to the parties, Mickey. Um been downhill since were, that brush with greatness with the global you elders You were invited thing. to the elders and you blew it. Nah, it turned out that that was, that was sub-elders. That could have been your ticket. To, well, you got to, you know, it's like you don't go get invited to Renaissance Weekend the first time. You have to go to Renaissance Weekend 3, you know, in Virginia Beach before you can go to the one at Hilton Head. Yeah. Jeez. Start at the bottom. Fate intervened. My family was stricken down by the flu, Mickey. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um... um Anyway, so thanks. Sorry to end on a on a on a by introducing. Cantankerous. You. It's okay. The, you're still game for doing on your, your brother Steve, right? If he's man enough. He's man enough. He's got a job, Bob. Okay. So we'll see if he's man. And enough. I don't think he pretends that he is fluent. You know, on on all topics at all times. I mean, like us. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm. So he'll get better. Yeah, we'll do one eventually. Don't worry. Okay. Um.